Welcome to All Grown Up Now, Tales of a Checkered Past. I'm Kenneth D. King, podcasting from my studio near Union Square in New York City. This podcast is an evolution of the tale, All Grown Up Now, A Friendship in Three Acts. This is season two, and it's called Tales of a Checkered Past. It's a collection of short stories from my salad days on up to the present. In each podcast, another self-contained story will be presented. These podcasts will be broadcast bi-weekly, so you get two a month. Enjoy. Episode 62 I call The Sunburn. The time, spring of 1981, the place, Oklahoma City, in Memorial Hospital. Daryl and I stood in the hallway outside of Barry's hospital room. Daryl looked at me and spoke. Well, you just gotta let him be, he drawled. Barry's one selfish boy. That's why it didn't work out between us. When things didn't go his way, he'd have a tantrum. I got tired of that. This is his pattern. He gets to a certain point, then does something stupid, and then moves to another place. It'll happen again, I'm telling you. For those who haven't listened to my podcast, Daryl was the guy I was dating in Oklahoma City in early 1981, one of the sweetest men I had dated up to that point. Barry was the one who introduced us. He had actually dated Daryl some time before. Barry thought Daryl and I would hate each other, but it worked out. But that's another story. I had just rescued Barry from a suicide attempt, dragging him into this hospital's emergency room only hours earlier. Barry was mad at me, mad at Daryl, mad at Oklahoma City, mad at the failed suicide attempt. Mad, mad, mad. He told Daryl and me that he was going to move to Austin, Texas to be with Mark and Vic. A few weeks before, Mark and Vic had moved there suddenly, like felons blowing town in a hurry. So, once he was discharged from the hospital, Barry moved to Austin. He and I kept in touch with the occasional letter and an occasional phone call. In the beginning, right after they moved, I also kept in touch with Mark as well. He would regale me with how wonderful his new place in Austin was and how Vic was doing so well at work and how it was a really good move. Mark had taken a job as a display person at the local military base's PX. A strange move, I thought. But perhaps there wasn't a Dillard's there. After a few weeks, Barry found a place to live on his own, so I would call him right there, not at Mark and Vic's. After the initial flurry of contact with Mark after he moved to Austin... There was a silence. Then one day, a couple months later, Barry called me with the news. Mark and Vic had up and moved to where he did not know. He hadn't heard from them, went by their apartment, and it was empty. They were gone. Just like them, suddenly moving. But Mark hadn't told me either. It was strange. As an aside... Mark told me years later that Barry had worn out his welcome, or rather got thrown out, for boinking Victor one time too many. Ick. Barry got an apartment, and then he had not heard from Mark and Vic for at least a month. So, like I said, one day he tried to call, but the phone was disconnected. He then drove over to their place to find it empty. They had gone, and they left no forwarding address. When I heard the news, I felt betrayed and a little lost. Mark and Vic were my role model for a gay couple. Yes, there were things I didn't understand, 
But I had thought that they were good people who gave the lie to the notion that gay people were flaky, transient, and generally irresponsible. Hearing that they up and disappeared was hard information to digest. But that was my only real troubling concern in that spring of 1981. Since for me, it was generally a time when things were going smoothly for me, work was going well, Daryl and I were setting into a groove, my social life was hopping, I didn't let it cloud up my life. But it did nag at me from time to time. The letter came in the mail on one of those balmy but not hot late spring nights in Oklahoma City where the sunset was particularly vivid. I particularly enjoyed sitting at the table in my little front yard by my tiny little apartment. It gave me time just to relax, open my mail, have some Perrier, and think about what I would wear out that evening. That particular evening, as I opened my mail, I sat there watching the birds darting among the plants and dodging the occasional golf ball lobbed over the fence from the golf course next door. As I sat there, I also thought about where I was in my life at the moment. Life was good. At the tender age of 23, I was the display manager of the largest department store in Oklahoma City, working a job I loved. I finally had a goodly disposable income that I spent on clothes and good living, no debts, or real responsibilities. And I was young, thin, and cute, which gave me opportunities for lots of reckless adventures and fashion misadventures. Also, I had a man who worshipped me, living right next door. I also understood that while this was mostly a carefree period, it wouldn't last forever, so I had to appreciate it while I had it. When I look back on this time, I know these will be my good old days, I thought to myself as I sat at the table, leafing through the mail. Then I got hit with a golf ball from over the fence. The envelope I was tearing open was postmarked San Francisco. It was from Mark, who I hadn't heard from since he'd mysteriously moved away from Austin, Texas. He wrote that he and Victor were now living in San Francisco, and he included a phone number and address. Now, this letter came around the first week of June, which meant that they were in Austin only a little over three months. Little did I know then that this letter would be a turning point in my life. At that time, I was also having a flirtation with a guy named Jim, who was a waiter at Pistachio's restaurant. So I'm a pig. Daryl was really understanding about all of this, especially after moving in next door and all. My bad. Jim was one of the blondes that I've ever gone for in a big way with his blue eyes and droopy mustache and the pretty little cleft in his chin. My friends Penny and Steve were with me the evening I made my first move on him and gave him my phone number. Penny was so funny. She acted like she wanted to crawl under the table, even though I warned her in advance so she could go powder her nose if she wanted to miss that performance. Jim proved to be very resistant to my advances, But we did have dinner a few times, and we talked a lot on the phone. He told me of the great love of his life, who I think is named Brian, who looked remarkably like me. He didn't know if he was drawn to me for me, or if it was because I looked like Brian. At one point, I told him I didn't really care. He could pretend if he wanted. I just wanted to get him in bed. I told Jim about the letter from Mark, which started Jim reminiscing about the times he had spent in San Francisco. It seems Jim was a dancer with Fred Waring's Roadshow, whoever in the hell he was, and they went to San Francisco on tour. Sadly, Jim got stranded in Oklahoma City during an illness while on that same tour, and they replaced him before he recovered. With no job, Jim was stuck in Oklahoma City and waited tables. And that's where I met him. It's a great city, Jim said about San Francisco. I would go back there in a heartbeat if I knew I could support myself. He dug out a book he had on the city. 
and we looked at the photos. Being in such close physical proximity, I of course made another move, which got yet another rejection. A few days later, I invited Jim over to my place for Godiva chocolates and Perrier, and yet another try at seduction. We had a civilized time for a while, until, again, he rebuffed my advances. I just don't know if I want you for you, or because you remind me of Brian, he exclaimed, yet again. I had had enough. I strode over to the front door. It took all of two steps to get there. My place was so small. Opened it, looked at him, and shouted, Get out! He was dumbfounded. Get out, I shouted. You're throwing me out? Yes! At that, I grabbed his arm and dragged him up to the door. What? When you decide, you know where I can be reached. Until then, get out, I said. And then I pushed him out, slammed the door behind him, and turned out the light. That next evening, I was still smarting from my last exchange with Jim. Now, I had made a dinner date with my friend Penny, who looked like Jane Russell in the film Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Penny, however, was six foot three in stocking feet and chose to wear the highest heels she could find. She said she couldn't hide it, so she might as well show it off. So, while I waited for Penny, I looked again at Mark's letter. To distract myself while I was waiting, I impulsively dialed him up. Now, to today's listeners, that doesn't seem like a big deal, but in those days it was called a toll call, which meant it was expensive. Hello, Mark answered. You moved to San Francisco, I said. Yes, Victor and I moved back here. We just couldn't deal with the homophobia any longer. Mark then lovingly described the fog rolling in over Twin Peaks, the cable cars clanging, the bay, the Golden Gate Bridge, and the lovely Victorian flat that they were living in, and how very happy he was there. I want to come visit, I said. What? I surprised myself on that one. I hadn't planned on saying it. Great, he said. When do you want to come visit? Victor has his birthday in July. Why don't you come out then? Of course you can stay with us. We have an extra bedroom. Okay, I said. Let me see what time I can get off of work. After talking hurriedly about logistics, we rang off because Penny was banging on my door. I was slightly dazed at what I had just done. Thank heaven for travel agents. I would never have gone through with this trip had it not been for a very understanding travel agent who held my hand and made all of the arrangements. She explained all about the tickets and getting to the plane and how it all worked, as I had never dealt with all that myself before. My people didn't go to big cities on airplanes. We generally vacationed with relatives by car. With my visit to California fast approaching, I started to prepare. First of all, Daryl brought over a copy of the San Francisco Chronicle for us to read to get a sense of what was happening. I thought you'd like to see what's happening there before you go, he drawled. The best way is to read the newspaper, so I got you one from that big newsstand downtown. Daryl was considerate like that. We both looked through the paper before we went to dinner and read with astonishment an installment of Tales of the City, What so amazed us about the topic was Michael picks up a policeman at the Twin Peaks bar (gasps) and talks about guys with no taste in decorating an apartment, how they're usually the best lays. (gasps) Well, our jaws were on the ground, we were so astonished. Talking about such things in a major newspaper, such a place this was. There was the question about what to wear. I started pouring through all my back issues of GQ to see what they had to say about what was being worn on the West Coast. My information showed bright colors, 
painter's pants, double wrap belts, and fisherman sandals. But the hair, what type of style was I going to wear? Jenny, my stylist, said all the boys in San Francisco were wearing a really short brush cut, which she would blow out so it stood on end, and finish with a little butch wax. Now, I hadn't worn hair this short, nor butch wax for that matter, since the fifth grade. Mom used to make me go to the barber to have my head shaved the last day of school so she wouldn't have to do too much hair washing during the summer. I hated it, and I swore at the time that I would never choose to wear it. Indeed. The color I chose was called Clairol Dark Warm Brown. I decided that any blonde highlights would look too cliché, as I wasn't from California, I was just visiting. The dark warm brown, combined with my green eyes, would be just the right look. But the finishing touch. Of course, since this was California I was visiting, I had to have a good suntan. I wasn't clued into the Northern California, Southern California thing just yet. So I decided to do all of my tanning in one weekend. So I was thankful that Brad the doll had moved from next door and Daryl was living there. That meant it was safe to sunbathe. Brad the doll was so good looking that I would never have shown that much flesh in our combined front yard had he still been living there. He might have come home from work and seen me. And besides, Daryl had already seen the merchandise. Mrs. Freeman, my cool old landlady, was quite amused when she happened upon me while doing her yard work, and she spritzed me down with the garden hose for some laughs. Thankfully, I got Mom's complexion. I never burned. I used to brag that I could stay in the sun for weeks and not even turn pink. It just turned tan. Unbeknownst to me, though, the hole in the ozone layer was especially large that day. The first day of my tanning marathon turned me red as a fire truck. This was a new experience. Even the breeze across my skin hurt. That Saturday evening before I went to bed, I slathered every lotion and cold cream I could lay my hands on over every square inch of skin. When it hit my skin, it melted like butter hitting a hot skillet. With all the oil and red skin and waves of heat coming off of me, I looked like hot asphalt in the desert at sunset. So, there I was that night, beached, stark naked and oily on my bed, with the lights out, because even light hitting my skin hurt. Practically glowing in the dark, I was so red. And then there was a knock at the door. Who is it? I shouted. It's me, Jim. He paused. I had to see you. Oh, great. Isn't this fine timing, I thought. Why? I shouted again, expecting yet one more disappointment. I want you. Tonight. Right now. Well, what's a boy to do? I was already oiled up, so I got up and opened the door, but I didn't turn on the light, that's for sure. He grabbed me and held me close. Ow! And he said, Oh, you feel so hot. I was wondering what it would feel like when I finally got to hold you. Ow! Ow! It's you, Jim. See how hot you make me? I said. What else was I going to say? His timing was perhaps a bit off, but this was a bird in the hand, so to speak. Besides, I wasn't sunning in the nude, for heaven's sakes. Then he kissed me. Ow! Wow, what a silky mustache. And you can guess the rest.
Thanks for listening. You can get the audiobook All Grown Up Now on iTunes, Audible, and Amazon, or from my website, allgrownupnow.com. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you have any questions, you can reach me through the website, allgrownupnow.com. You can follow me on Instagram at Kenneth D. King, on Facebook at Kenneth D. King Design, or on my main website, kennethdking.com.